But then the fact that we hear this voice before she goes to Thornfield, and then as she's starting to have like these ominous feelings leading up to the wedding, she like gives a name to this voice in her dreams or just in her self-reflection of saying like, this is Mrs. Jane Rochester. Like, and it's kind of like, oh, here's the person I thought I was going to be. And now that like, I don't have that opportunity. I'm haunted by like Jane Rochester, who I can't be. And I don't know. It's interesting how that voice kind of took on different personalities at different times in her life. Lillian, hello. Good morning to you. How are you today? I am doing so good. How are you? I am also good. Before we started recording, we were commenting on how snuggly we are. So I'm all wrapped up in my cozy bathrobe and you've got an awesome Lizzo sweater. So I think I'm just ready to like chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's our, our cozy fall morning, but not too early because we're nice and sharp today. <laughs> exactly. <Podcast episode. laughs> So this week, we are talking about our very first radio drama adaptation of Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. um, and since Lillian is our brilliant curator of kind of like <laughs> planning out our schedule, uh, she selected the 1994 uh, Syrian Hines version. And <laughs> I gotta say, even though I thought this was like a great production, as I was three hours in, I was like, why did we choose the Syrian Hines one when we don't <laughs> even like Syrian Hines? <laughs> It's because it was one of the ones, it was one of the first ones that was suggested to us. And I could not find, as I like went through, I could not find where that suggestion was. So I apologize to the listener who's not getting credit for this, but someone did <laughs> suggest, I had in my notes that it was suggested to us. So that's why it was the first radio drama that was suggested to us. So that's why it's the first one that we're reading guys. Awesome. But well, yeah. as this uh, progresses and we do more radio dramas, uh, I did full on flip out when I found <laughs> out that there is um, a Vincent Price radio drama. So that will come eventually, and that will be a very exciting time. But who cares about that right now? We're talking about Syrian Hines and the sister of Emma Thompson. So let's do that. Is it Emma Thompson's sister? It's her sister. Oh my god, that's crazy. Sophie Thompson. <laughs> I didn't connect. I saw. I googled her and I saw all these pictures of them together, and I didn't even connect that that's her sister. I'm so dumb. Well, you know how like exciting it is when you meet someone who has the same last name as you and looks a lot like you, and so then you just hang out with them all the time. Yeah, that's what this was. <laughs> that's, yeah, I do that, but I just do that with other with random people that I meet on the street. Uh, yeah. It's, at the annual meeting of cotters who aren't related to each other. Every family sends one <laughs> person. It's super normal. Do you guys not do that? Right. But Lillian, I'm sure you've heard me tell this story before, but when I was in elementary school, um, I was in my class. There were these two people <laughs> and they had the same last name, but they didn't look anything alike. So one day I went up to um, Eric and I was chatting with him because he has like straight, short brown hair and his sister has like long, curly red hair. And I was like, hey, Eric, isn't it so weird that Carly has the same last name as you? And he just stared at me and he's like, she's my twin sister. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what? Excuse me? How dare you? <laughs> I forgot this story and I love it so much. It's so good. It's one of those moments. I know I've had a thousand of these in my life, but it's one of those moments where I'm like so confident in something and I'm like, um, this is the thing. And everyone's like, no, it's not. <laughs> so one of well, many. And this is the thing that's so lovely about Piper that I'm sure our <laughs> listeners have gotten to experience a couple of times over the course of our podcast. Um, but she's the kind of person who like immediately tells on herself when mm -hmm. something like this happens. I've heard this story a thousand times, always told by Piper, always is like, <laughs> isn't it funny how dumb I am? And it's <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, you know, I love owning my mistakes because then I can learn from them hopefully except yeah. I don't keep being confidently wrong so this is what you guys tuned in for which is old stories from our childhood right which speaking yeah. of do you know the year this radio production came out um the year that we were born the best year the year where all good things happen yes um, which is the year <laughs> we were born 1994 mm -hmm. please don't dox us or steal our identities about that <laughs> 
So Lillian, I've given one gut reaction about this. Mm -hmm. Before we do a recap of what happens, do you want to say a gut reaction or do you want to start with a recap of this four hour long podcast uh, radio drama? Um, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but my gut reaction is I felt like it was a really solid start to the radio. Like I think the... I didn't necessarily think about how different of a medium radio would end up being. Mm -hmm. And I think this was, to my mind, a really solid example of like what a radio production of Jane Eyre would be versus some of the other versions that we've seen. And yeah, she's a hefty boy for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, once again, Lillian reached out to me, I think like Thursday or Friday, and she's like, have you started listening? Because it's four hours. And I was like, what? Four hours? <laughs> No, I had not started listening, dear that's, listener. <laughs> that's another advantage of the Vincent Price one you wanted us to do is it's only like 45 minutes. So yes. it is, I promise <laughs> it's the next radio adaption on the list. Cool. Very cool. I know our listeners are like, I mean, I get it. This is what you guys are thinking about it. But what is it actually a, like what happens in this mm -hmm. radio drama? Yeah. And I definitely remember all of it and knew that I was recapping and remembered to take notes. So oh, good for you. OK. I mean, you do not I have didn't. to do recap four hours. So. I don't remember. I'm just going to recap the story of Jane Eyre. All right. Perfect. Yay. All right. So we start out with Jane being attacked and then put in a very scary room, um, which honest to goodness spooked me. I was glad I was listening during the day. Um, and then she gets sent off to a school where the teachers are some, some of them are nice. Most of them not so nice. And she spends a lot of time there and we spend a whole hour basically on her childhood before we meet a very angry man <laughs> in the street. Um, and he, it turns out is her boss and he's quite rude to her, frankly, um, and yells at her by a fire and then tells her lots of stories about his life while being incredibly condescending to her. Um, and then it turns out he's in love. And we find that out when he brings a lady back to the house who he helps tease her with. Um, and then he very obviously is a gypsy, which was upsetting. <laughs> and then... Um, they get married and he yells a lot um, at everybody. He's super pissed at everybody for being such assholes to him because we keep forgetting that he's the real victim of the world. So she leaves um, and meets a very nice lady who just lets her live in this house. And then also her brother is there. Um, and he, the brother falls in love with her and is also mad that Jane won't just love him. <laughs> Um, and then she gets 20,000 pounds and gives them away to just the t one sister and the one brother. Um, and then she uh, is considering a marriage proposal before she hears a, hears a voice on the moors and runs back to Rochester, where they spend a very long time talking about exactly what happens to every single person they've ever met in their entire lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does she marry oh, him? They're in the happy. End? Oh, she yes, <laughs> listeners. She marries him. Yay! <laughs> does she marry him in the end? And I just go, no, no, no. I stopped listening. She <laughs> so actually knows. She actually realized that this guy was a fucking dick, and so she <laughs> did not marry him. Um, that was a minute fifty four seconds. So long, <laughs> almost as long as the four hours of radio drama. Okay, so I think before we dive into kind of analyzing this um, adaptation, one thing I'm curious to talk to you about is so. Growing up, I did have um, experience listening to old radio programs because my dad loved listening to those. And so if we, whenever we were like driving around, if he was like, you know, either taking me to school or doing errands or going on road trips or whatever, we would be either listening to audiobooks, um, which is a very fond memory that I have with my dad, or we'd be listening to old radio dramas. And so his stuff would be like, I listened to like the old War of the Worlds with Orson Welles with him, or he loved listening to these like old, um, like Superman uh, serials online on, on the radio. And uh, that's how we listened to Tintin together. So I have an experience with this kind of format. Um, what is your history with it, if any? Um, honestly, this might be the first radio drama I've ever listen to at least that I that like stands out to me my family was more audiobook people in on long road trips yeah I feel like that's that's similar though 
It's similar, but I was trying, I was just hilariously, my mom is on the road trip that I listen to the most podcasts or like, <laughs> not podcasts, uh, <laughs> but I listen to the most uh, audiobooks, which my grandparents live in Iowa. So we would drive the like two hours and we'd always listen to something as a family. And my mom is driving to Iowa right now. <laughs> um, and I was just talking to her and I was like, it's a radio production. She goes, what would that even be? <laughs> so I was trying to describe to her. She's like, so they're just reading the book. Like, how is that different? And I'm like, well, it's like, there's more sound effects. And they're like a bunch of different, there's like a whole cast of people. And she goes, that's so mm-hmm. weird. And I'm like, way to be open to new experiences. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that struck me right away is that, so Siri and Hines, it felt to me as if like, and this came first, right before he then was cast in the movie. Isn't mm-hmm. that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this felt like, I guess the movie was kind of a just he just did it again. So Mm. um, I didn't feel like there was much difference in him doing an audio version versus an audio visual version. I don't know. A lot of the delivery felt the same. But then I am inclined to just think about the fact that I think you or somebody that we had on the show mentioned that in some interview, he Mm -hmm. said that he's like, I don't like Rochester. And I think he just like plays him as a dick. And so there's just a lot of just anger and gruffness in him which is not something I'm a fan of yeah so I actually interestingly enough have a recording of or not a recording I have that interview so it was Charlene it was actually in the care so much episode um, that she did which was also in the feeds for earbuds but yeah so he did an interview right like as part of the press tour for the movie in 97 Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually have some quotes from it because this was something I wanted us to talk about. And now seems like a wonderful time to do that. Let's do it. So basically, he was cast because the director of that movie heard this radio production and was like, I really like the level of emotion that he's expressing. Hmm. And I think something that's really interesting to me, and we'll talk about this more, is I feel like this radio production made small, like nuanced changes Mm -hmm. to moments and characters that make Rochester worse. Yeah. Um, And I have a few of those listed out. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, in this interview, which is part of the controversy, I imagine, of the responses that he gave, he says he's never read the book or watched oh. any of the movies oh no oh. so this radio production and then ultimately the screenplay for the movie were his only understandings of rochester hmm, that's probably why um yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> so so this is his description when he's like talking to someone about he says i haven't seen any film versions or read the book I don't want to because I'm worried about the impossibility of translating that to the screen. I wonder, I would wonder why particular scenes are left out and that would cause frustration as well as getting in the way of what the screenwriter intended. So that's somewhat fair. Mm -hmm. Um, But he says, Samantha Morton, who was the Jane to his Rochester in that movie, read the book several times and was like a big fan of the book. So a lot of his interpretation of the character of Rochester came through her, which is really interesting because he didn't have that before doing this radio production, obviously. So he says that the the danger with Rochester being played so many times is that I risk being shut down by critics, but a good story is a good story. And this is still about two hearts. I hope to communicate real emotion. And I hope that sometimes there's an extraordinary feeling when you get it right. So that's like, that I feel is really valid. Yeah. It makes sense why he sort of didn't read the book Mm -hmm. if I like get that idea that like you're trying to portray the character in this movie and that that can be separated from the character in the book that makes Mm -hmm. sense to me to an extent yeah however then he goes on to describe how he sees the character of Rochester Mm -hmm. and most specifically how why he thinks women are attracted to the character of Rochester so Mm -hmm. this is starting from the reporter's perspective and then it goes into the quote um He believes that Rochester is selfish, arrogant, a bully, and sexist. You 
could say that he is a man of his time, a rich landowner with power that he abuses. I wouldn't fancy him, and I wonder why women would find him attractive. It is the power, I think. Interesting. So I feel like with that reading of his whole being like, here's all the things that I think about Rochester. I mean, it's very clear he has not read the book in which you find a lot of the sensitivity, the mm-hmm. care, the the things that we do love about him. There is. It's interesting the thing that he said about getting what is good about the story and the character from his co-star in the movie, which Mm -hmm. here for this radio drama, he obviously didn't have that influence yet. So maybe he was just simply operating on the, this is a sexist, powerful guy. And therefore that's how I play him. Um, And I think you do see, so that's kind of the biggest difference that I see between his performance in this radio drama versus his performance in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, I think in the movie, we we talked about the fact that we really liked how sympathetic Rochester was prior to his leaving. Mm-hmm. And I really felt like that was missing from this radio drama. Like, I did yeah. not think that his scenes where he's talking to her, I he seems like an arrogant asshole. Like, he really, I really hate this version of Rochester all the way through. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to think, I was like, it's there are moments where his tone isn't as garbage. Like there's moments where he's like doing all these other things. So Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out like the details of why that is. But I think before we move on to some of those like very specific nuancey moments, I think fundamentally, and this explains the scene, like a lot of the ways that he portrays Rochester. Mm -hmm. I think Syrian Hines does not understand what women are attracted to in Rochester. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, personally sure. don't think it's the power. I don't think yeah. it's a downside that he's a powerful landowning man. Mm-hmm. But Jane very clearly doesn't care that he's a powerful landowning man. That is not why she is attracted to him. Right. And I don't think it's why the vast majority of readers are attracted to him. For, so for him to pull that specifically out, that mm-hmm. women are attracted to power, yeah. was incredibly infuriating to me. So oh, I- totally. Yeah, especially since even in the production itself, they kept the line in when, you know, he's doing his explanation scene and she's pushing him away and he says, oh, so it was just my title that you were attracted to and the fact that I had no wife. And now that you know that, like, I am married, then you don't want me anymore. And she's like, no, you fucking idiot. Like, that's not why I liked you. Don't throw away what we had because you're angry right now. Like, yeah, so yeah. that's that's very interesting. So I I one of the things that I'm curious about that I want to talk about before we go into the like nuances of this play that is we'll talk more about Syrian Hines' performance, but I really wanted to talk, call this out specifically mm-hmm. is what would you say in answer to the question of why are people attracted to Rochester? I think for me, so there's an element of there's surface level for sure. There's when we first meet him and leading up to his appearance, there's an element of mystery, which I think anyone would find like alluring about any individual. And so but then I think right from the start, I think one thing that is for me initially very attractive about Rochester is despite his power imbalance between him and Jane. He is right away from their first meeting on the road, very like forward with her, very on the level with her. Um, And then as soon as they're back at the house and he's very curious about her and wants them to be equals, that for me is something that I think really draws you in where it's like, here's this mysterious guy who is like my boss and is way higher than me. And yet he is asking all these personal questions. He seems to honestly care about my responses. That's, I think, it's like, whoa, like you have my attention, sir. I want to keep spending time with you and see who you are. Like that for me is the big draw. Yeah. I think that was, so I was, after reading this interview, I thought about that idea a lot of like, obviously to me, it's like so obvious that that's not it. So mm-hmm. I just was thinking about that. And I think it's the same thing you're saying where it's like that genuine interest that approaching her as, as that equal Um, And as that person who he, he is interested in talking to, and she's been in spaces where the only other people who've ever been like that with her were other women Um, Mm -hmm. and her, but her closest friends, like the people she enjoyed speaking with and being around the most. And so that's one of the big draws. And then I also think the mystery that you talked about for sure, I hadn't even necessarily thought of that. But I think that something that Syrian Hines does do a really good job of capturing, 
but is the reason why it misses in the end is the passion. Yeah. Like that passion and drive for life and mm-hmm. caring about things. Like that's the thing where I think Syrian Hines miss, it does a good job of portraying the passion, but misses the motivation behind it. Yes. He creates this character that is arrogant and selfish and all of these other things, which you can read Rochester that way, Mm -hmm. but you have to then read that he also has these other things, which is where and why that arrogance and that passion comes from. Mm -hmm. Syrian Hines misinterprets that because he's a powerful landowning man, Mm -hmm. as opposed to him being someone who was not like did not have power for a really long time. And Mm -hmm. so now that he has power, he really understands what that is. And he understands he has this very specific view of life that is so against the society that he's claimed that then Syrian Hines is like claiming is the motivation. Right. So I think that that's, I I know we don't really have a leg to stand on when it comes to judging people for not having read the book. Um, (laughs) But I think if either of us were going to play the character, we would have read the book. Right, exactly. I I don't know. It's good to do your homework um, before Mm -hmm. you dive into a classic character such as this. One thing I will say um, before we move on to our next topic is that one thing that stood out to me from the interview quote that you read is this idea of like the level of emotion that he can bring. Um, and so it did stand out to me. Obviously there's all this passion and everything. I think most of the time Syrian Hines is just kind of yelling and shouting and being kind of angry. But one element of his performance that I did appreciate is in the stay speech scene. He sounds very sad, vulnerable, emotional. Um, and I think that comes through very well in his vocal performance. Like he literally sounds like he's starting to cry. And I thought that was a very like, whoa, this is a very delicate individual right now. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was a good scene. I liked that a lot. And I think that that's so interesting because it, it's the same actor and it's the opposite moments that I'm most critical of. Mm -hmm. Like I'm most critical of Syrian Hines performance in the 70 or not 70, the 97 movie Mm -hmm. when he's doing the stage speech. Like that's when he's like yelling and essentially like you think he's going to throw Samantha Morton down the stairs. Like (laughs) versus like this, like you said, I was floored listening to this stage speech. I was like, well, if you had done this, I would have loved you. Like, what are you talking about? Where before that I was like, wow, this is where he got all that anger from for his betrayal for the movie. Like he thinks that this is a terrible man and is just such a dick. Yeah. And who knows, maybe that has to do partially with direction. Like when the movie was happening and totally. then the director is like, grab her, scream in her mouth. And it's just like, oh, gee, stop. I, in the same <laughs> way that I think a lot of, it, given the fact that he is, has not read the book, like his arguments for not reading the book and um, not watching other movies, I think makes sense to me that you want to portray the character that the screenwriter and the director are trying to create, which mm-hmm. is always going to be a little bit different. I think that could be in and of itself a whole movie of like, is this all the same character and you should be as close and true to that character as remotely possible? Or do you get to read into and interpret your own character out of this initial text and like build off of it in your own way? But I think that's what he is trying to say is that he's built, he's creating these characters. And I think whoever wrote this, I actually probably have her name somewhere in my notes. Um, But Whoever created, it's dramatized by Micheline. We're going to go, I'm going to just pretend that I'm confident about it. Warden (laughs) wrote the, did the dramatization of this radio production. Mm -hmm. I think she doesn't like Rochester. Yeah. He, a lot of the moments of sympathy in this, like are slightly changed in such a (laughs) way where I think it makes Rochester more of a dick. (laughs) <laughs> what are some of your specific examples? So when Jane and Rochester are speaking to each other, which in, in that first moment by the fire, which I do know that in the book, that scene is very Rochester monologuing. So mm-hmm. I get that they had to give some more lines to Jane to make it a conversation. So it's not just four hours of Rochester monologuing. Right. Especially but, since they only have audio to work with. So mm-hmm. yeah. It changes the the meaning of things like there's these particular moments of i uh, he says the line 
the line where it's normally Rochester saying, I'm accustomed to saying this and it gets done like that line. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's Jane saying to him, you must be accustomed to giving orders. Mm -hmm. That's really, really different. Mm -hmm. Rochester having the awareness that he's saying something and catches himself Mm -hmm. using a tone that's not appropriate to be using in this particular situation and calling himself out and apologizing for that is really different from Jane catching him and calling him out on that. Right. And so although this is one thing that did strike me about that scene. So typically, like you say, yes, if Rochester is the one, then he suddenly we have a scene where here is a a character with a lot of self-awareness. What it read, what it read to me instead with Jane kind of calling him out, it really stood out to me how I was like, damn, like this girl is very bold to just be sitting there with her employer and be like, hmm, you sound like you're really bossy. And I'm just like, whoa, girl, <laughs> like you just met this guy. You are ballsy. But then I guess that's how they're kind of playing it is Rochester being like, wow, she's such a daring woman to call me out on my bullshit. <laughs> and so it's just like a different path, right? Yeah. And I think there's there's another moment that's like similar to that as well, where Rochester and it like it again flips that a bit where it makes it makes Jane bolder and Rochester more of an asshole, which is the moment when generally Rochester asks. So he he does this, but like generally Rochester asks her if he'll be different, if she'll be differential to him just for a moment, and like indulge him in his want to like draw her out and have this conversation and like will he will she just for now like do what he's asking her to do Mm -hmm. and then she reminds him of her salary and the fact that she pays it and he goes okay well then because of that will you be differential to me and usually jane says because you forgot that Mm -hmm. i'm your employee i will i will allow this to move forward where she says because you don't care that i'm your employee and that's another like it doesn't matter but it does matter. (laughs) It's it's these little things. It really changes it a whole lot. Yeah. It changes the tone so much because she's giving him a motivation as opposed to acknowledging the fact that he forgot. And I, Mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like he forgot, like the way that he talks about it, it does not sound like he forgot. And frankly, it does sound like he cares. Mm. Like it just, and so that's the way that like these little moments that are just so I we're becoming those people um, (laughs) who like are like um the difference between care and forgot in this very specific sentence well I mean if this is for the the entire purpose of our podcast I think we have to be those people like to dissect like what makes this version not work even if it's Mm -hmm. only a few lines different from a different version which I actually think is really cool to say like look you change something slightly and the whole tone is different because I feel like yeah whereas in the situations like the book for for sure and some of our favorite versions of of Jane Eyre we see a from the outside what should be a powerful unfeeling man is actually a very vulnerable sensitive person who like treats this girl as his equal and that is what we fall in love with whereas here we are getting more it's kind of like a standoff between two like oh we're both hot-headed powerful individuals and maybe we like that about each other and i'm not as into that story i like the sensitive much more the interesting thing the reason why i pulled these moments out of as like this is in like this is not just a difference in tone this Mm -hmm. is like an in a rewriting of the actual words, because I think one of the things I've enjoyed so much about doing this podcast and as we're reading the book and all of these things, we've talked about in the book, how open for interpretation these moments are. Yeah. If you change Rochester's tone, it totally changes everything that's happening. If you read the line that I can, I'm used to saying things and people do them, Mm-hmm. in different tones it yeah. totally changes the character totally. i don't think this is an i don't think calling rochester an arrogant selfish bully is a wrong interpretation it's not the way mm-hmm. i interpret him but i don't think you're wrong to interpret him that way yeah and the fact that then there's these other changes that make it so that that is inaccurate like it changes mm-hmm. the tone in a way that is perpetuating a particular narrative as opposed to simply interpreting it differently. Yeah. And especially like, that's probably the biggest thing that I noticed in 
this new type of format that we're watching or listening to mm-hmm. is the fact that all we have is their words and the way they're saying them to each other. Like yeah. that we don't get as much of Jane's, Jane's thoughts in her head in these moments. We get more than we do in most of the movies because there are those moments of narration, but mm-hmm. not within the conversation. Within the conversation, we just have their tone back and forth. And I do think like, he is so condescending to her. Yeah. And I think that's a valid interpretation of Rochester. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. there's validity in reading what he's saying in the book and yeah. go, what a condescending ass. One thing I didn't like that they kept in this and they did it multiple times was him both in the proposal and both in the stay speech is Rochester literally feeding lines that he wants to to hear from her to Jane, but he's demanding that she says them. He's Mm -hmm. like, say my name, which could be really cute in other versions. But the Mm -hmm. one that I hated is in the end when she wants to leave. And he's like, he's like, no, say you'll stay with me forever. Say it, Jane. And I'm just like, Jesus, you're the worst. And I hate it so much. And I think that that's so interesting. Like, that's the thing that's interesting to me about it, right? Like, if you Mm -hmm. choose... If you wanted to write a version or or perform a version of Rochester being an asshole, that's how you do it. Yes. Um, and so it's yeah. these little changes that I'm like, no, you missed it though. Yeah. Like, um, and and just like the the conversation the next day, his tone really changed and he was like a lot calmer about things, but mm-hmm. he was so arrogant. Like he was yeah. so certain of all of these things and just like I yeah. could not, I could not with him doing that. That was so annoying to me. Dude, one of my favorite little changes that I noted that stood out to me is when they're doing the like um, kind of flirting over money. Like, I don't think the woman doing the adaptation either caught the significance of this in the book or she just thought there wasn't enough time. So she chopped it out. So when he's like, well, you'll need some money. Like, how much do you have in the world, Jane? And she's like, only these shillings. And he's like, here, take 10 pounds. And she's like, cool, thanks. Bye. Like, she does not like turn it down. She's like, thank you. I will take that five grand. See you later. <laughs> like a few moments like that where like they include scenes that are i like you either whole like whole whole scale just cut that because it's not going to make sense here and it's just not going to fit mm-hmm. or you put the whole thing in because it's about this flirty back and forth they're having where this was just him like being her dad giving her her allowance yeah like it just <laughs> wasn't I thought that was very funny. <laughs> it was so funny. It was so weird. There were so many moments like that where I'm like, I mean, you included half of the words of that scene, but you missed the point of that scene. <laughs> <laughs> so Lillian, we've talked a lot about Syrian Hines. Um, let's talk for a bit about uh, yes. Sophie Thompson, sister to Emma Thompson. I have to say, I wasn't crazy about how like breathy she was like she's just really breathy and there were some moments where like i was listening to this and i'm like this almost sounds like kind of erotic i was like everybody needs to chill out a bit here okay like this is public radio who knows what five-year-old is going to be listening in the car when your mom is doing groceries and they'll be like mom why is that lady gasping so much no i mean i thought she did a great job but i definitely got annoyed with her voice by the end of four hours and just how breathy everything was with her yeah i think in order to portray jane's youth she went really um she went really high-pitched in the voice yeah which I get. It's a choice. Yeah. I get mm-hmm. that. Um, and I don't know that the erotic breathiness was unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's moments where that's great, but there are other moments where I'm like, lady, all right, calm down. <laughs> like, let's chill out for a bit here. Um, so yeah, there's, there's moments that I definitely figure that. And then there's other moments where like, yeah, there was like, when she's recounting the dream and like running after him down the road and stuff, like they're trying to portray the action. And she really leaned on the breathiness to portray the action, which Mm -hmm. I did also note as something that I was like, okay, we get it. I get it. I do. I get it. Please stop. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, there was, there were some other things too, where first of all, I like, I was like, is this the same actress doing the child voice? That's going to then do the adult voice. And it was, and she did not change it that much. No, Cause I was really. like, thank goodness this child voice isn't going to last forever because it's so annoying. <laughs> and then we get to her as like 19. And I'm like, and I think that that's another thing that like, um, Syrian Hines really harps on. And I think is something that is like very clearly in this 
this whoever did this adaption was really obsessed with the age difference as an as thinking it was an inappropriate thing, which it's not mm-hmm. not inappropriate. Yeah. But it's also like, don't make her sound 12. She's not yeah. 12. Yeah. That's different. <laughs> they they do, they bring it up all the time. And like, I mean, I I like that Fairfax has that interaction with her when she's first talking about Blanche and she's like, but they couldn't be married because there's this much age gap. And Jane's like, what's Mm -hmm. wrong with that? Huh? I think it's fine. And she's like, Jesus, calm down. Okay, whatever. Do what you want. But then Um, at the end, too, when she goes back to um, like Rochester, he like has a comment. He's like, like, I don't want to just like be like a father figure to you. Yeah, they talk about it a lot. Um, So I think you're right. Someone was fixated on that. And then there's just some other things like there's, so there's a particular brand of feminism that was, that was sort of became popular starting in the nineties and really like was in a lot of Disney movies in like 2010, Mm -hmm. um, which is this idea that like, there's one type of feminist woman Mm -hmm. and that feminist woman is, has a successful career and is really like powerful. It's like, it's very much the girl boss. Yeah, it's the yeah. Jasmine reimagining. Like, it's just like, I'm going to put my hands on my hips and yell at you. And I don't think that type of feminism is inherently bad. But the idea that it's the only way to be a feminist is bad to me. Yeah, agreed. And I think that that's one of the things that I really enjoyed in reading this book and in talking about this story is mm-hmm. really exploring this particular type of feminism that Charlotte Bronte was speaking to and the idea that women have this vast internal life that's equal to any man's internal life. Um, And I think that, and that there is a power in the empathy and emotions that women have and that, and by giving a character like Rochester an equal level of emotions, that is actually in and of itself quite feminist. Yeah. Yeah. We're like some of the moments, some of the ways that we've talked about this idea of like how giving some of this confrontational dialogue to Jane changes her character. Another thing that is just straight up and down, like not in the story and unnecessary Mm -hmm. is her randomly expressing that she's saving money to start a school. Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Yeah. That's like from the start. That's something that she puts forward. You're right. (laughs) She like, he like randomly, I was so annoyed when I heard that. Like he's like, what, like, what do you want your dream to be? And like, She's like, I, I dream of like saving enough money to start a school. I'm like, Jane did not think that far ahead. Like she didn't have that much of a plan. She just wanted to do something else. And the thing that is particularly frustrating to me with that is not only does it, um, imply that you have to have a plan and you have to have like a goal in that way, Mm -hmm. but it also invalidates her actual dreams and goals. Like it's a very capitalistic idea that the way that Jane is going to, empower herself is not through self-actualization, not through being a real person, not through having this broad internal life, but by starting her own small business. Like, yeah. What and, the hell? And also the fact that then she gets it too. Like it's, it added another odd layer to the, wow, what a lucky circumstance that you've run across your family and look, oh, there's that school you always wanted. Nope. Now it's yours. You got it. Also, here's some money poured in your lap. You're an independent woman. Like it doesn't feel, yeah, you're right. Quite so earned. And then the other thing that happened in that same conversation that if somebody correct me, if I'm wrong, but I have never seen this in another adaption of Jane Eyre. She specifically, they're talking about tales of romance Mm -hmm. and like the tales you hear about women. Um, And it says they end in the same, like, I can't remember the, I didn't write down the exact wording, but they all end in the same track, like basically tragic ending catastrophe. That's what she said. Now I'm remembering Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) catastrophe, which is marriage. Jane does not feel that way about marriage. She's not thinking of marriage. She doesn't intend to get married necessarily. But again, Mm -hmm. she's not worried about those long-term plans. She's worried about being a good person in the here and now. So this is a very specific narrative that this person is putting onto Jane Eyre Mm -hmm. that is perpetuating a moment in time and like a view of feminism in that time that I think now is more outdated than the original story of Jane Eyre. (laughs) I completely agree with you. And I think that's, yeah, very astute observation. 
One thing that was another big change about this that I thought was actually kind of interesting, I did enjoy this, is the presence of this female voice that we hear from the beginning and throughout the entire thing. And at first, like it kind of acted as sort of like a premonition to the ghost uh, that we would sort of experience while she's at Thornfield, which would eventually be Bertha, of course. But then the fact that we hear this voice before she goes to Thornfield, and then as she's starting to have like these ominous feelings leading up to the wedding, she like gives a name to this voice in her dreams or just in her self-reflection of saying like, this is Mrs. Jane Rochester. Like, and it's kind of like, oh, here's the person I thought I was going to be. And now that like, I don't have that opportunity, I'm haunted by like Jane Rochester, who I can't be. And I don't know, it's interesting how that voice kind of took on different personalities at different times in her life. Um, at most of the time, I thought it was kind of annoying, like, because it mostly just said, Jane, Jane, eh. like, it would just kind of like whisper and be like a ghost. And sometimes she would say things and it would like echo her as like a like little spooky hype, like hype man. Um, but and then, of course, I felt like it was also sort of like a premonition to eventually hearing Rochester kind of whispering her name on the wind. So what did you think about that? This this presence that kind of follows her around? I actually, I, I really liked it. And I thought it was a really interesting way to incorporate some of that, like goth, those Gothic elements into Mm -hmm. this radio drama in this unique way that I think would only feel real in a radio (laughs) um, interpretation in the same way that the way the music played into this, I, I think felt very similar to me, but specifically the voice. Um, It reminded me of this interpretation of Bertha, actually, that I have a video on that I have saved for our episode to talk about when we talk about Bertha, Mm -hmm. um, which is the idea that there are some interpretations of Bertha as a counter to Jane, like as a Mm -hmm. balancing of like Jane's own insanity. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the idea of somebody being the like there's there's different facts that I'm not going to remember correctly, but I promise we'll talk about it in more detail in the future, um, mm-hmm. which is the idea of like the third floor, the attic being you're speaking about somebody's mind. Mm, cool. um, so that being so there's there's ways to take that and turn Bertha into more of a metaphor. Mm -hmm. for the possibility of a woman going crazy. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea that there's this mixing of the laughter that we know to be Bertha Mm -hmm. with Jane's own thoughts and Mm -hmm. this way. And there's a moment, I believe when Jane even says like, am I going crazy? Like when she's trying to leave and all this stuff. So the idea that there's a version of Jane that is insane and that she has to fight against that insanity and that she could (laughs) just as easily be this mad woman Mm -hmm. I think is super interesting. I agree. I liked it. Um, I thought it was a a nice, unique addition um, that like some things we haven't really seen before. It was actually curious to me because I feel like we've talked about this a bit when we were doing our episode about the early chapters of Jane Eyre, um, where there are quite a few references to like angels um, when Helen is talking about like we all have like an angel that's sort of like watching over us kind of a thing. And so it was I think I had said in that episode, I was like, it'd be cool in like if I was doing a movie version to have sort of like a figure that's kind of always in frame and yet out of sight that's Mm -hmm. kind of just always there and so that is sort of been like captured in this performance as well so Mm -hmm. I like that that theme was kind of picked up on yeah I thought that was fantastic as well um yeah all right what do you think of um the pacing and the way that they like what moments they chose to focus on in this story because it is one of the longer ones we've consumed it's about the same length as the bbc 2006 miniseries Mm. um and not too far off of the 83 i think the 83 is a little bit longer Mm -hmm. i thought it was they spent a lot more time on elements than i'm used to and a lot less time on other elements than i'm used to so I think it definitely could have used an edit. Um, I imagine the fact that this was a four-part um, episode series, that they were playing it over the span of four days. I think they should have instead done a long weekend, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just three episodes. And then you could have cut out a lot of stuff that kind of made it feel like it's dragging, focus on the big emotional like kind of key points. Um, so yeah, I think it could have done with shorter time. I, I also felt like they it was 
bizarre to me the moments they decided to, to, to gloss over versus the moments they decided to really like expand on. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, they spent so much time at the school relative yeah. to how much time they spent in the Reed's house to the point where I was like, later when she's talking about um, family with him, one of the other moments that they said is like, instead of saying none that would um, own me or none that would claim me, she says that she has um, none that she ever saw, which yeah. is just inaccurate. <laughs> yeah, she's just lying. <laughs> um, and so that was that was sort of bizarre. Um, and then, but I think like then you, the, to the balance of like how much time they spent at the school was interesting to me. Um, and then similarly, the amount of time that she spent, like the the idea that it was Diana instead of. Sinjin that met her at the door and like invited her in and like overrode Hannah and then Sinjin was just like whatever and I'm like that's not how Sinjin would have reacted to that <laughs> yeah. um but I thought that was interesting and then the amount of time that she spent there like there were so many moments where I was like why isn't this the end of the episode like this should be the end of the episode and then they like do another five minutes like they want yeah. to leave it on a cliffhanger and I'm like you understand that this is the cliffhanger right like they right <laughs> it was just sort of weird um so I agree with you I think they could have cut it down a lot one thing that I will give them a lot of credit for is something that I have always felt authors and storytellers in general should use more of is time jumps mm-hmm. because I uh, stories that take place like over the course of a week. And then these people are like, so devoted to each other, that they'll die for each other. I'm like, that's not realistic. No, <laughs> that's not to say that in intense situations, you can't become really close with someone. Mm-hmm. But like, I think particularly in a case like Jane and Rochester, like Jane saying things like, and that's how the course of the next eight weeks went. And the more that I got to speak with him, the more that I felt connected to him. Like, I like that idea of, oh, okay. So they're building on this relationship and they're becoming more connected over the course of several weeks. It makes me believe them more. (laughs) Right. Which is something that now having read the book, I feel like there are so many opportunities if you're doing, and this would not work as well in an audio drama, of course, but for like a movie or a TV adaptation, there's so many opportunities for montage to show time passing, just little glimpses of her and him spending time together to like establish in a short like amount of time visually, like how their relationship has grown over like weeks or months. And I think that's very clear in the source material. And I'm surprised I've yet to see it in a visual medium um Mm -hmm. here yeah in an audio drama you could only have like a line where it's like and then months went by and we held hands a lot and but i think gave each other goo goo eyes from across the room (laughs) goo goo eyes yeah goo goo eyes are like oh hello oh one other moment that um i just was thinking about it's like the way they did blanche was so weird they there were several points where like I so I'm actually going to double check because I happen to have the whole cast list like a crazy person. <laughs> um, but there were several points. OK, so, yeah, there's not an actress at least credited to be um, Blanche's mother. I swear I thought several times that that was Blanche's mom. Like there was a couple of moments where like they gave the governess criticisms to Blanche instead of to her mother, which was really interesting. And then a moment that made me that was another like minor difference that totally changes the character it's blanche talks shit about governesses and how stupid they are and how all of them are worthless mm-hmm. and rochester says indeed oh god yeah no he really sucked at taking that like i'm gonna make jane jealous but i'm also gonna be mean to her like way too far no not cool and he, i'm like listen there's a lot of things that rochester would do but he would never talk shit about jane never he ever would, ever he would, he would sooner never. punch blanche in the face and then he would agree with that statement <laughs> um so there's no way he would have done that and then the there was another one oh the other like minor change that i thought was so dumb was um when the gypsy shows up Mm. and she they they come in and they're like i don't know she like what he there's a gypsy and wants to tell fortunes and blanche is like oh my god that's so cool i'm so excited about that we shall get our fortunes read and And they're like that is not that is not hard to just have that happen off screen Mm -hmm. and come back and be like, 
And now that everybody's had their fortunes read, she still won't leave. She says she knows there's another woman here, which is what happens in the book. Yes. And instead, what do they do, Piper? They're like, oh, there's a gypsy at the door and she wants to read fortunes, but she all she wants to talk to the governess first. Like, that's not suspicious at all. I'll be like, wait, hang on. <laughs> did this govern, did this so-and-so uh, called uh, gypsy happen to just be like the man of the house in a funny outfit? Because that sounds a bit more right to me. Yeah, oh, it just was like the dumbest nonsense. There was a oh. couple of those. I think I think this was like, the, so the reason why I think this was a good start for a radio play for me is I think the other elements they did really well, like um, to use a word that I learned from watching behind the scenes footage on DVDs when I was a kid, the Foley work is great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think like this, the way that it felt like it was alive, that was really well done. The background noises. I liked the soundtrack. I liked... Mm -hmm the w the way they did a lot of these elements mm -hmm. but i think it would it's not the best version of something like this that you could do so i'm very yeah. interested there are a lot of radio versions guys <laughs> we're probably not gonna listen to them all because they can't no. be that different from one another but um... there's like five that orson wells did orson oh wells did like five radio productions of this it's wild well, we only need and, to listen to one of his and people used to not be able to go back and re-listen to these things right like mm -hmm. they had to be played on the radio so if you're going to make it play on the radio you may as well do a new version yeah um but yeah uh, no. No, the Foley work sound effects um, are bread and butter of a good radio drama. It really like makes it feel real. Um, yeah, at one point at the end, uh, Pilot, the dog was whining and my cat Minnow like perked up and looked over at me. She's like, what is that? And I'm like, it's a fake dog. Don't worry. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> yeah, dogs whining is the fastest way to get Ruth's attention for sure. Um, Very nice. Are we ready to rate this thing? I feel good about it. Yeah. So Piper, you go first. What is your rating for this? Um, I'm going to give this, and this is going to be mostly just based on like how much I enjoyed listening to it. Um, I'm going to give this a four out of 10. Yes. <laughs> Cause I did not like it that much. Um, four out of 10 Syrian Hines. Okay. Um, I have the exact same score, which is, I think this might be the first time we've done the exact same score. Hey, wow. Look at us. Um, look at us. Uh, four out of 10 ghosts. Oh, very Ooh. nice. Ooh, good we're and spooky. Coming, we're coming up to the spooky times. Hey, hey. Speaking of the spooky times, our next episode is a palate cleanser. And again, I know that our listeners are fully obsessed with us. Thank you. We're obsessed with you too. Mm -hmm. um, and you might be going, but Lillian, there's only been four regular Jane Eyre episodes since the last one. We're correcting for the <laughs> fact that, that, that we switched it around last time. So we're getting back on our regular schedule. Um, I'm sure you all <laughs> also have your own Jane Eyre Airbud spreadsheet. Um, mm. So that's just a note for you. But yeah. our palate cleanser episode comes out on the spookiest day, which is Halloween. So mm -hmm. Piper, what are we watching for Halloween? Um, well, uh, there's a little well-known classic that you might recall from the year 2003 called Disney's The Haunted Mansion. Uh, <laughs> this is a very silly movie that should have been probably a direct DVD, but wow, they released it in theaters. Uh, and it also happened to be, um, a beloved favorite of young Piper so much so that in 2012 she's like you know what this movie is great I do love it but I gotta say they really missed the ball when they decided to give most of it uh to Eddie Murphy being silly and having ghost adventures when really the true heart of this film is the fact that there is an unbelievably good and spooky gothic romance as any Jane Eyre fan would love which is the mistaken identity situation between Edward Gracie and Sarah or as he believes her to be, Elizabeth Henshaw, his dead fiance from 200 years ago. So anyway, uh, we are going to be talking about this movie because I actually wrote a fan fiction about this that I've been working on for 10 years. Um, I'm a big lamo, so I printed it. I will Not, have copies. No. I'm going to, I'm going to cut off the self, bad <laughs> self-talk. You're the coolest person ever who wrote a book length fan fiction. Thank you. That is that you have been working on for 10 years and gone through the process of editing and getting art done for a cover and you're getting it <laughs> printed so that fans of your work like myself can have something beautiful and wonderful to hold and read. Well, anyway, thank continue you. Continue to describe it now. 
Anyway, so this book, A Dance with the Dead, uh, I will be having it printed. So if you are curious to read more, I can either send you a link to read it online for free or I can send you a physical copy because I will have that. Um, but anyway, that is the reason why we are going to be talking about uh, the beloved classic. <laughs> Yay. <Mansion. laughs> and I'm sure we'll talk more about how we can get access to that and all of that stuff next week. Um, speaking of things that we do outside of this program. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually just wanted to mention the, the program that, um, the interview, the infamous interview of Siri and Hines was mentioned on Mm -hmm. care so much, uh, has a very cool episode that I think our listeners might enjoy coming out tomorrow, which is my other podcast, by the way, guys, it's not just like something that I know about. It's a very Um, good podcast. Thank you. (laughs) Um, and that the episode coming out tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the day that this episode comes out, so it'll be coming out. I want to say that's the 24th to the Tuesday of the week. This episode comes out is on romance books. So I had a really cool guest who's a book talk influencer come on and we talked about all the reasons why we love books with smoochin. Mm-hmm. So I I had a blast. I just I'm editing it today and it was so much fun and I think you guys will really like it. So you can I can't hop wait to over listen. to there and listen to that. Yay. Yay, you. can't wait. Dude, who doesn't love a good book with tons of kisses? I mean that's yeah. um my first question, if anyone's like, hey, I got the story for you. I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Is there some smooching? Okay. Yeah. Continue, it's, continue. It's the number one question. That's what we yeah. talk about a lot. And we talk about the fact that some people don't like joy. Yeah. And they don't like being happy. <laughs> Who needs those? And those no. people suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you are not that person. You are one of the <laughs> amazing, wonderful people who do love kisses and uh, <laughs> whenever it happens in Jane Eyre, especially. So if you want to share your love with us and your thoughts with us, you can find us on all of the major social networks at AirBuds. Uh, you can also send us emails um, with uh, your fan fictions that you want to share and maybe we'll read and review them. I, for one, am interested. Um, send us an email, uh, airbuds at gmail.com. And if you guys are listening to this and you're like, wow, this is the greatest podcast that's ever been recorded. First of all, thank you. Yes. Second of all, can you tell some people about that? Because not everybody knows. So <laughs> a great way to help us out is to leave a review with however many stars you feel we've earned. Obviously five. Um, and uh, just a couple of sentences about why you like it actually really, really helps us out. So we so appreciate those of you who have done that. And those of you who I'm sure will do that in the future. Um, And maybe share it with a friend of yours who also thinks kissing is good. Yay! We should have that on a shirt. Kissing is good. (laughs) If you'd like a kissing is good or just AirBuds t-shirt in general, please email us that as well. Yes, we may be setting up a Patreon. Who can say what the future will hold? Who can say what the future will hold? (laughs) Um, But until then, uh, we hope to see you back next time. Thanks for listening, guys. Happy Jane Eyre reading and watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.